the Honorable Gentleman from Minsk, a call to the fret. As someone already wrote above, we only have two branches, and they are connected in one place. Intersecting stations have a common exit. In the hall, where the exit is located, there is a side corridor to the right of the escalator. As far as I can remember, there have always been turnstiles there, and the doors behind them have always been closed. In theory, these doors should lead to an exit marked with a green circle on the peak. Hence the question, if the exit was never built, why weren't the turnstiles removed? Why are they even there? Secret tunnels to escort the president? As for the legends of the Minsk metro, I heard that either near Frunzenskaya or near Sportivnaya, there is a side government tunnel, and it can supposedly be seen when the train leaves the station or approaches it. Opinions differ. They also told me why the exit at Porovmaskaya was made on the left side. All the other stations have exits on the right. Porovmaskaya is the only one with tracks in the middle and platforms on the sides. They say that the depth of the honest station under the river was incorrectly calculated and at one moment, water simply poured down the wall. To prevent the station from flooding, it was necessary to urgently redo it. But there really are no cool stories about a metro. The branch to Sportivnaya was intended to turn trains around when it was the final one. The same thing exists on Moskovskaya when it was the final one. Poravmaskaya, indeed, was built almost under the river and was not properly calculated. Because of this, they chose too shallow of a depth and when they started digging in sandy soils, everything simply flooded. It was necessary to urgently redo the station in order to strengthen the vault. My grandfather, who at the time occupied a significant position in the Research Institute of Land Reclamation and Soil Science, whose correct calculations of the depth of the station were never approved, lamented this for a long time and fought with the Metro Construction Company that collaborated with them. And about the other station, you made me think, I go there almost every day. I've seen the turnstiles, but I've never wondered where it all leads. It's a shame to even post something like this here. Okay, about three years ago, a neighbor lived next to us. Now his apartment has long been occupied by other people, and probably me and Baba Sonia, the aunt from our floor, remember him. The man's name was Fedor. He was a cheerful guy. He told different stories. He knew how to interest people. He was completely lonely. No children. He had a wife, but she died as soon as they moved into our house. I loved sitting with him at the house and listening to his stories. So we sit with him, we chat, and he tells me about his work, and he worked in our Moscow metro. The metro originally was built as a huge bomb shelter. What we see on the walls of the carriages, these intersecting multicolored lines, is only a tenth of the huge underground metropolis that lies under Moscow. Fedor talked about many tunnels, about dark branches that only workers know about, about what a trackman does when walking through the underground city with a pocket fanatic, what he sees in the black holes of the subway. He spoke for a long time. It was interesting. Then he fell silent, spat, lit a cigarette, and said, Do you know that people disappear on the subway every month, one or two people at a time? I've heard the rumor before, I said. Indeed, people are disappearing, but it's almost unnoticeable. Usually, these are homeless people who stay overnight to warm up, or the workers themselves are linemen, like my uncle Fyodor. You passengers are not particularly attentive people. You drive, read newspapers, listen to music, and if you were more observant, you would notice them. Who are they? I asked. Real inhabitants, permanent residents of the metro. We are just guests. It has its own life, and the one who disturbs them becomes their food. They often watch us from the black holes of sewers and ventilation. In our country, sometimes they find all sorts of disgusting things in the tunnels. Rags covered in blood, pieces of meat of the same size. They say that it's dogs or any other living creatures that wander in and they end up under the trains. But interestingly, they quickly shut down this information 
and try to stop it from spreading. And it's not for nothing that the Metro keeps giving people massive salaries. Otherwise, they would have run away long ago, and no one would work there. And also, be careful. Anything can happen. Don't wander around late. I was studying in Moscow at the evening and returned home late. And if you're standing in an empty station, stand as close to the middle as possible. You will be safe. After the conversation, it was quite unpleasant, but I didn't really take it seriously. Some time passed. I was returning from my mother's. I spent a week with her. As usual, I called Fedor at the apartment to say hello. The door was opened by a young woman. I was surprised. It was the neighbor's niece, who had not visited him for a very long time. I asked where Fedor was. She leaned over to me and said, Don't you know? He disappeared on night duty. He went to work, bypassing the emergency tunnel, and did not return. His gloves and a flashlight were later found on the rails. Maybe he fell through somewhere. You never know. There are all sorts of holes. I hope they find the body, at least. We'll bury it. And then she slammed the door. I felt so sad. I knew for sure that Fedor would never return from the underground city. Hello, Anons. I'll tell you a little story. An ordinary day. In the evening, I'm on my way to the subway from work. As usual, the places are all occupied, and all sorts of grandmothers are driving the young people away out of the seats with reproachful glances if they did not have the time to pretend that they were sleeping. I do this myself, but this time there were no seats, so I stood, as usual, on the side of the doors and leaned my back on the bench. Whoever has been on the metro knows this place. I'm standing, looking at the passengers, a little bored, very bored. And then she came in. She was wonderful. Long legs, red curly hair, breasts. Oh, her breasts. I have no words to describe her breasts. Sheer perfection. Although she was wearing a tight-fitting dress, her breasts were not constrained by a bra, and all of her curves were visible. Considering that all the seats were taken, she had to stand opposite me. I lost my breath a little, and my heart rate increased. In order to not scare away such a sweetheart, I lowered my eyes, but I couldn't stand stupidly and just look at the floor. I'm not a nerd, but I couldn't even look straight. What if she decides that I am a maniac, a pervert, or a sperm-toxic fella? Naturally, the only correct solution was to look forward, to admire such beauty through the reflection of the glass, and for about a minute, I stupidly turned my head and pretended to look around and look at everything around. But slowly, my gaze moved without fawning in the direction that I needed, and I got ready to enjoy the trip. She had just taken out a book and was deep in reading, not paying attention to anything around her. Very carefully, I looked at her reflection. And you know what? There was an old woman standing in the reflection. The old woman also held a book in her hand. But unlike the woman who was not her reflection, she did not read it. She was looking straight at me. I don't even know if it was an old woman or the corpse of an old woman. Colors are not particularly visible in the reflection. Her eyes, they radiated anger and hatred, and all of these emotions were directed at me. And I clearly understood why. Because I saw her. Because I saw her for real. And at that moment, when I realized not a reflection woman raised her eyes and began to look at me in the same way. The reflection looked at me through the reflection. The non-reflection looked at me directly, and both hated me. And I know that if there was no one else in the subway car, she would try to destroy me, and most likely, she would have succeeded, since I was simply speechless from this. Time, as it were, stopped, and we drove to the next station for probably a century. At the station, I got out on still stiff legs. What a blessing that she did not follow me. When the carriage started to leave, I managed to turn around. She looked at me with hatred all this time. After that, the carriage took her away. This was three hours ago. I am at home now. I locked the door 
and put a chair under the door, although I know that this will not save me. In five minutes, I became completely gray. I've already drunk 400 grams of vodka, and I'm not at all drunk. Such things, reader. Ride carefully on the subway, and don't look at those traveling with you. You probably already understand why. That's all. Anon, I want to tell you something strange. I'm in DC. I work as a networker. We run the internet, installation work, setting up equipment. Well, yesterday, Friday, that is, the day before yesterday, we installed Wi-Fi at the Tolskaya station. We install it in technical rooms at both ends of the station, or inside the tunnel immediately behind the station. You have to run from one end of the station to the other, and all the work is done after one in the morning, when the trains are not running. And here we are, once again, jogging from one end to another, when I notice footprints on the platform. Moreover, the station had just been washed, and all traces are washed and wiped off, that is for sure, in my presence, and these traces are bright white, which for some reason, I did not pay attention to until that moment. Well, I just looked at the strange direction of the tracks, but I didn't even think about taking a photo. Fuck, I need to take pictures of the tracks. And it was only because of the strange direction that I remembered them, the pictorial pattern. And when I came home and googled it, it turned out that a man had fallen under the train that day, and it sent a shiver down my spine. No, the last footprint was exactly as it was drawn, like half of the shoe seemed to have been stepped down. Who knows, maybe the shoes were dirty in some way, hence the traces were not washed off. Yes, they scrub the floors until they shine, plus thousands of people walk here every day. Have you seen marks on the floor somewhere in the subway that cannot be washed off? It actually bothered me that I did not notice this bullshit from the very beginning, because I'm a bit of a slouch myself. That's the kind of work, eh? And I'm almost constantly looking at my feet. What I meant was that the marks were strained was something that was difficult to wash off, either from the one who jumped, or from the one who took out what was left of the one who jumped. So, the version of the sofa inspector, a man jumped on the tracks, he was fucked. The driver, and usually he should do this, went to get him, got his feet dirty on the tracks, and between two passes, left these marks. This is a logical version, but who knows, the tracks look kind of ghostly. We are reviving this one, Italian ghost train. In the post-Soviet space, a version of the legend is known, which is popularized by Nikolai Andreevich Shukashin, a retired captain of the first rank, journalist and philosopher. His story features an Italian three-car tourist train, which in 1911 made another pleasure trip. Suddenly, near the entrance to the tunnel, in a strange, viscous fog that appeared out of nowhere. The train disappeared, along with all the passengers. A more detailed version of the legend claims that two people from among the passengers managed to leave the train, and the story of a viscous fog that caused a panic attack among everyone on the train is known from their words. Legends about the ghost train in other countries. Since 1911, a train similar in description to the missing train has allegedly been seen repeatedly in different parts of the world. In particular, in 1955, track worker Peter Grigorovic Ustamenko near Balaklava, Crimea, allegedly saw a train passing along an embankment on which the rails had long been dismantled. The locomotive and the carriages were clearly made by a foreign manufacturer and looked rather primitive. The train moved completely silently and somehow it managed to crush the chickens that had not noticed it. It seemed that there was not a single living person on board. The curtains in the carriages were drawn. The person who saw this train claims that at that moment he was sober and aware of what was happening. On the same day, an explosion occurred on the battleship Novorossiysk. A ghost train of the same description was spotted in 1991 in the Poltava region of Ukraine. However, the existence of such a move in the Poltava region is questioned. They say that a similar incident 
occurred in 1994, in late autumn, at the Polovina station. After 11 p.m., a young man who stepped out onto an empty platform saw an old-style train slowly pass next to him with an inscription in large yellow Latin letters. The witness remembered the conductor in a brown uniform, wearing a hat with a band. He had a collar fastened to his shirt, and he also noticed several people in the windows of the train. The arrival of the train was not announced on the tannoy. The train did not have its own route. One of the articles devoted to this legend states that allegedly in the 1840s, 104 people appeared out of nowhere in Mexico. They were considered crazy because they all claimed to have arrived from Italy by train. The author of the article suggested that these were passengers of a ghost train that fell into the past who managed to leave the train. It was the summer in the daytime. We are going somewhere, say to Trenkov, an ordinary routine trip, an ordinary everyday train, 4,000 tons, coal train, covered, over passengers, speed, 80 kilometers per hour, approaching Zarechnaya, warning green, entrance two, which means we are on the move along the main road, signals are open, without stopping, it means you won't be able to run to the station and chat with the beautiful carriage driver and what a beauty she is. She is a fairy tale. We sit and chat with the other assistant, admire her charms, and regret because chatting with the carriage driver is a pleasure, and we are deprived of it today. We break. The speed drops. The assistant continues to lament that there is no stopping. And suddenly, he becomes silent mid-sentence and stands up. I, too, suddenly feel a little uneasy. I look at the speedometer. Sixty. Then at the instruments. Everywhere, they show the norm. Everything is normal. But there is some kind of incomprehensible alarm. Something began to pound in my temples, and my heart skipped a beat. The assistant also fidgets. He looked out the window and looked at the train. Nothing is wrong with the train out here. Everything is in order, he said. But he was all restless and nervous. We enter the station, a long track too. On the first track, a passenger train stands and waits for departure to rest off. On the fourth track, an abandoned train of empty covered carriages is read. We whistled a greeting to the familiar driver smoking in the passenger cabin. We are driving sixty between two walls of train cars, and we are worrying for no discernible reason. I didn't even sit down. I stood up. The assistant and I stuck our foreheads on the windshield, and we are waiting for something bad both of us, simultaneously, but there's nothing, just empty rails. We had almost arrived at the tail of the passenger train. We had already whistled a warning, and then, 15 meters in front of us, from under the wheels of the covered carriage of the train abandoned along the fourth track, an old lady climbs out with her ass pointed forwards and pulls a huge bag out from behind her. The bag is huge and heavy for the frail grandmother, Without looking at us, she pulls the bag caught on the rail, trying to pull it out from under the roof onto the rails, along which we are almost approaching her. At the same time as the assistant, we are tearing up the train. I hit the emergency, step on the sandbox pedal. The diesel locomotive rests on its horn, and the grandmother disappears from our field of vision. She goes somewhere under the diesel locomotive, and the last thing we remember is the view for the windshield of her slipping on the tracks and under the front of the train. We stopped. I did not have the mental strength to look out the window. We walked towards the exit with stone faces. We got out. Silence. Somewhere under the fifth or sixth car, something dark was there. We approached slowly. We found her bag of bottles, which was cut in half. We stand and look at each other as if dumbfounded. Where is the old woman? There's a scream, swearing, and that same granny crawls out from under the roof, pulls another similar bag of bottles, and curses us because we dare to break her bag of bottles in half. I saw her, with my own two eyes, falling and disappearing under the lower edge of the windshield. The train was a tall one, sure, 
but I only lost sight of her about five meters before the impact. How was her bag of bottles cut in half, but she managed to remain completely unharmed? The answer is a complete mystery. A terrible discovery awaited a group of mushroom pickers near the village of Balakovka, Vologda region. On September 15th, four mushroom pickers found the body of a man torn to shreds on the railway, leading to an abandoned peat mine. Several meters of sleepers were covered in blood. The blow was so strong that the body of the deceased shattered into fragments. Two women fainted at the sight of this corpse. A few hours later, a criminal case was opened into the death of an unknown man under a train. Investigators were shocked. It turned out that the last train passed on this abandoned railway line about 20 years ago, and since then, it has not been used. Rusty rails and sleepers overgrown with growth were the best proof of this. The cause of the man's death has not yet been established, but one thing is clear. No other force than a train moving at a great speed could have mutilated the deceased in such a way. What killed him? There is no answer to this question. And one more mystical fact that was practically ignored by the Russian press. On June 14, 2001, the Minister of Railways of Turkmenistan, Hamurat Burdiv, died. And how? Right in Ashgabat, next to the locomotive depot, and even during the inspection. Allegedly, the minister did not notice the approaching locomotive and died under its wheels. According to rumors that are still circulating among Turkmen railway workers, the driver of the locomotive that ran over the minister saw how the official was knocked off the tracks by some powerful blow even before the shunter passed. Of course, these vague statements were not included in the materials of the investigation conducted by the Prosecutor General's office, as well as the fact that there were no traces of a collision on the shunting diesel locomotive. No blood. No microparticles of fabric from clothing. Nothing. However, Burdiv's death definitely came from being hit by a locomotive. The nature of the damage clearly indicated this. But what kind of locomotive could have done it, if not the one passing there at the time? What could exert that much force to kill him in that way? This is how stories come to light that the railway workers themselves do not like to talk about out loud. A driver with 40 years of experience, Vladimir Donskoy, said that during the time he drove electric trains in the Moscow region, six tragedies happened to him. Three deaths can be explained. Either drunk teenagers pushed a friend, or a girl standing at the edge of the platform was sucked in, and he will never forget the three victims that could not be explained away. Do you know how one gets sucked under a train? If a person stands close to the edge of the platform, then a wave of elastic air pushes him to the side. The man puts his foot down to maintain balance and pushes himself under the train. When the wave leaves, it enters a zone of rarefied air. It usually sucks in those standing at the beginning of the platform where the train is still flying at speed and always under the second carriage, laws of physics. And I had three people sucked in in front of my nose before I even arrived. Can you imagine? I'm approaching the station and from a distance, I see a girl standing close to the edge of the platform. I signal. She takes a step back and suddenly falls under my wheels. Everything happens as if she was pushed under me by some force, but I see that no one is around and that she didn't even move. This happened two more times in different years, and every time in the materials of criminal cases, they wrote it the same way. They took their own life. All the investigators argued with me when I came to the relatives of the victims and told them that they were not trying to take their own life. Mystic, I fought for a long time and talked with other drivers, Everyone agrees that sometimes an invisible wave appears about 70 meters in front of the train. Such power, as if there was another locomotive going in front of you, a ghost or something, so he sucks people in. About two years ago, a strange incident 
happened near Novgorod, the freight train was forced to move at low speed. The semaphores were strangely lit, although the dispatchers gave the green light. Thanks to the low speed, the driver managed to break when he saw an obstacle on the way. Dead people. A man and a woman. The locomotive stopped a meter away from the corpses, cut in half. Since there were no other candidates, this incident was blamed on the same freight train. They say that the driver first ran over the people and then brought the train back. This incredible version turned out to be the only one because all the trains that passed along the section were traveling at a speed of 90 kilometers per hour. And if people had died under the wheels of any of a train, then fragments of bodies would have been collected along the sleepers over an area of 100 meters. And here is a slow moving train with neatly cut halves of bodies and the driver and assistant who swear that they drove up to those who had already died. In our area, central and northern Ukraine, the story of the ghost train is well known. Supposedly, this is a pleasure train that disappeared in 1904. In 1904, in Italy, while traveling through a new, at the time, super long tunnel in the Alps. If you believe history, the train quite often appears at the crossing in the village of Zavalice, Poltava region. It is absolutely real. That is, it is not an incorporeal substance, but without people, and it travels on its own. The question just arises, how do dispatchers and drivers of oncoming trains comment on this phenomenon? It was studied by V.P. Leschate of the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine, head of the Department of Paranormal Phenomena, and it seems that during one such study, he jumped onto a train at a crossing, and no one has seen him since. All interesting facts and details of this phenomenon can be found in the book 100 Great Mysteries. The article is called Ghost Train. I read about another case in the UFO magazine, although much of what they write does not inspire confidence in me. Allegedly, during the Great Patriotic War, a steam locomotive and several carriages with important cargo and the entire train crew disappeared during a trip. The searches carried out, including on secret branches, naturally did not yield results. But after three days, the train arrived safely at the destination space. The drivers and company, of course, were immediately captured by NKVD, which was Russia's special operations unit at the time. Imagine the surprise of the railway workers when they learned that they had been absent for three days. They were sure that they arrived on schedule and certainly did not disappear anywhere. And as proof, showed a watch that showed the exact time of arrival and was exactly three days behind. But even greater was the surprise of the special commission of the NKVD and transport workers when it turned out on the locomotive that all of the instruments were sealed. The seals had not been broken, but nevertheless, the speedometer shows exactly the distance from the point of direction to the destination. Let me remind you that they searched the entire route of the train, plus some other routes, but did not find anything, and the chronometer shows the same time as the driver's watches. The versions were like something like abduction by aliens, or the lifting of the entire train into the air by some German aircraft. In short, the matter was hushed up. These are war times, and no one needs this kind of publicity. The Mystery of the Missing Train Perhaps there is nothing more ordinary for Muscovites than the capital's metro. The only thing that never ceases to amaze us is the ever-increasing fares and long, sometimes up to half an hour, train stops for technical reasons in the tunnel between stations. All this, of course, is annoying, but nothing more, but in vain. It will be worth sometimes turning your attention to the mosaic frescoes with leaders in the underground halls and remembering the era when the Moscow Metro was created. That era was full of secrets and mysteries, which is confirmed by more and more new, sometimes terrible finds. This story happened in 1975, but it took almost 20 years for one of its participants to decide to tell a journalist. Then, in 1975, they were ordered to forget everything and remain silent. 
But Viktor Stepanovich could not remain silent and wrote about what happened in one of the central newspapers. The answer came within a week. Viktor Stepanovich ended up in a psychiatric hospital from where he was released only six months later when he officially admitted that he was mentally ill and that everything that happened was the delirium of a madman. What were the official bodies at the time trying to hide? This is what Viktor Stepanovich told the journalist. When I entered the office of the head of the electrical depot, my entire team was already there. In common parlance, we are night crawlers of subway tunnels. Our entire area is the ring, and I knew them quite well. He knew dead-end tunnels, siddlings, civil defense warehouses, and other utility rooms. Therefore, when I heard what they were talking about, I did not believe it at first. I decided it was someone's joke. Only the presence of two silent people in civilian clothes in the office made me believe what was happening. It turned out that yesterday, that is, a whole day ago, an entire train with passengers and drivers disappeared on the wing. Disappeared. Evaporated. Moreover, it was unknown where exactly on the ring that they disappeared. There was only one report of a serious schedule violation in the past 24 hours. The train from the Belaruskaya station at an interval of 14 minutes. This happened at 9.16pm. Therefore, only on the stretch could the ill-fitted train disappear. Indeed, there was a small dead end there, but even if we consider that somehow the switch worked and the cars automatically turned there, then in this case, the train could not have disappeared. The dead end is too short. It barely fits two repair cars. And how would the rest of the train have remained on the main track? And no matter how ridiculous such an assumption may be, our brigade and two of the authorities went exactly there. When we arrived at the site in the repair car, it was about 9 o'clock in the evening. All traffic along the ring was temporarily stopped. We stopped in front of the arrow at the dead end turn and went out to inspect the tracks. Then we went deeper into the tunnel, all the way to the wall. Nothing unusual was observed in the stone vaults. And suddenly, there was a muffled rumble, and we felt a subtle tremor under our feet. Before I had time to realize that it was the mechanisms of the miners who had come on the second shift that had started working in the next tunnel, the arrow moved from behind with a clang, and immediately, the entire wall of the dead end began to creep up. We were so amazed by this eerie sight that we were literally dumbfounded. A few moments passed, and a gigantic, illuminated hall opened up in front of us, reminiscent of a metro station but with one single track on which the missing train stood. The rumble we heard again, and the wall of the dead end began to move down. As if on cue, we took off and rushed into the diminishing passage. The wall closed behind us, and the lights at the ominous station went out. In the midst of this ominous darkness, only the train cars glowed with a dim emergency light. We turned on our flashlights, and whispering to each other, headed towards the train. The first thing that we noticed was that the last carriage was badly dented. Apparently, the descending wall touched the roof of the carriage that did not have time to slip under it, and only then did the entire train stop. There were no people anywhere to be seen. Several times we shouted in the empty huge hall, hoping that someone would respond, but in vain. The silence that followed our screams made it especially creepy. There was a feeling that everything that was happening was unreal, that time and all life stopped here. We went through all the cars, but found no one, although there were plenty of traces of people's presence. It seems that the passengers of the ill-fitted train had been here for at least several hours. Empty tin cans lay everywhere. In one of the carriage, things lay as if someone had slept there. On the platform itself, we found an extinguished fire, made mostly of newspapers and magazines. There was also a baby stroller with a pacifier inside. I must say that we were very mystified by what we saw, and personally, I got pretty scared and suggested that we got out of there as quickly as possible, but apparently, there was no tunnel or any exit from the room. We searched every corner, convincing ourselves 
that there was definitely a way out, because the people who were on the train somehow left the station. After fruitless searches and attempts for an hour to find the mechanism that raised the wall, it suddenly went up, and the driver of the repair train appeared before us. Noticing us, he shouted for us to leave the dangerous area as soon as possible, and for good reason. As soon as we approached the repair train, the wall behind us lowered again, blocking the passage to the mysterious station with its stone chest. Already on the way back, the driver told us how he managed to free us from stone captivity. While exploring the walls of the tunnel with a flashlight, he came across an electrical distribution board, rusted from time and decay. By pressing all the levers and buttons on it in a row, he ensured that the wall rose again. After the events described, I fought for a long time about what I saw and came to the following conclusion. Apparently, the tunneling work that began in the adjacent tunnel caused unwanted vibration, as a result of which a contact in a forgotten electrical panel was activated, moving the arrow from the main track to the alternate one, and then automation came into play. Unfortunately, at that very moment, a train with passengers was passing along the ring. Thus, it fell into a trap. Only one thing remains unclear to me. Where did the people from the last train disappear to? When I was released from Kashchenko, I naturally visited the tunnel again. However, I no longer found either a dead end or a rising wall there. Everything was carefully walled up and hidden by a laid cable. So, this mystery remains shrouded in darkness to this day.